every once in a while in the history of science, there is what you might think of as a crossover problem in which something uh, which has been important to scientific discovery and to the advance of science crosses over into the realm of um, popular culture and politics. And this has happened um, just over the past several years with stem cells. So um, oddly enough, we find in elections going back uh, to 2002, politicians talking about their policy or their attitudes with respect to stem cell science. And I got to tell you, if you uh, go to Sacramento or Washington, which I do pretty frequently, um, you won't find many members of Congress or many members of the state legislature who know the difference between a chromosome and a gene. And yet they have an idea about stem cell science. So what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit um, about the underlying science, just enough so that some of you who may not have a uh, background in, in science are conversant with the basics, and then talk a bit about the political context and uh, what the, where this science is going and to the degree that it poses a moral dilemma um, or broaches moral um, and ethical issues in politics and popular culture, to talk a bit about those as well so that uh, we improve our ability to have an intelligent discussion about these. This is an area in which there has been a lot of unintelligent discussion, unfortunately, and it has served, I think, to slow down the science and to make it harder rather than easier to understand where we're going. <clears throat> so some of, you, some of you may remember Dolly the sheep, and this is uh, uh, something I want to bring up to contextualize what we're talking about. You'll, re you'll remember, and some of you were young at the time, um, that Dolly the sheep was the first mammal that was cloned by a man named Ian Wilmot in Scotland, and it provoked a great um, hue and cry, both in the halls of Congress and the state legislature, but also in places like Time magazine, about what would cloning mean? Uh, would we be cloning monsters? Would rich people be able to clone themselves? Um, and there was a lot of hand-wringing about what role government should take with respect to controlling this powerful new technology. As it has turned out, cloning has dropped into the background and stem cell research has moved into the foreground. So I'm going to start in, in, I think, an odd place here, but uh, perhaps an important place. In a way, the history of stem cell science dates back to Hiroshima in 1945. And when uh, the Americans dropped uh, the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, perhaps 100 to 140,000 people were killed. Uh, most of those people did not die as a result of the blast and uh, from from direct damage, but rather they died because their blood producing systems and their bone marrow were wiped out. And no one understood exactly what happened until these people began to die by the thousands and then by the tens of thousands. And scientists after that time, partly because of our own interest in national defense, people during the 1950s thought that the Russians, after they had achieved atomic bomb technology, could use the bomb against us, and so they wanted to know, is there something that we could do to immunize ourselves uh, from the results of radiation, wiping out our blood-producing um, apparatus in our bone marrow? And so people began uh, in the 1950s to look much more closely at actually what produces blood and what kinds of cells um, exist in bone marrow, and that put them on the scent of understanding uh, what came to be called in the next generation stem cells. <clears throat> so I just talked about the destruction of the blood forming system from uh, radiation. By 1961, um, researchers at UCSF and at Stanford had discovered a new type of cell. Um, these were cells in bone marrow and they're quite rare, uh, one in 20,000 um, in the bone marrow but uh, they were able to isolate these cells and to propagate them um, in vitro, meaning outside the body. And this opened the door to what by the early 1980s would uh, um, allow researchers at Stanford and UCSF to identify what came to be called embryonic stem cells. 
So we talk about embryonic stem cells, um, but I'd like to point out that this is a bit of a misnomer. And as you know, the language that we use to describe things and the way that we picture things, which I'll be getting to in just a minute, are extremely important in how we understand them in the world. They're important for our politics. They're important for our own ethical constructs. And to call embryonic stem cells these tiny things, um, embryos, slightly misstates the case. And no one in the 19th century, I think, would have made that mistake. In the 19th century, embryologists talked about a pre-embryonic state, the first few cell divisions, which I'll get to in just a second, before the, um, before the embryo implants in the cell wall, in the uterus. Um, the remarkable quality, which we'll talk about in just a second, about embryonic stem cells is that they have what's called pluripotency, meaning that these are cells that can become any kind of cell in the body, teeth, hair, blood, brain. They are the progenitors for every cell type in the body. And somehow, there are signaling mechanisms that program them to take specific routes to become the cell types that form the whole human body. <clears throat> so you all know this, that uh, sperms fertilize eggs, that the zygote, the fertilized egg, uh, begins a series of cell divisions. And these happen fairly quickly in the first few days after, after um, fertilization. And what we end up there on the right-hand side is something which is called a blastocyst. I have no idea why it's called a blastocyst. But um, it has two kinds of cells. One is a, is a cell membrane that includes um, or encompasses an inner cell mass. And those first few cell divisions, uh, 2, 4, 8, 16, are the stem cells that are the subject of this talk. And they have very special and extraordinary qualities. <clears throat> this is what they look like uh, through two, four, eight, sixteen cell divisions in a, a powerful electron microscope. Um, and you have some idea what they look like. And it's important, again, uh, we're talking about visualizing these things. Um, I was at a talk not long ago with a young woman who's a researcher in Irv Weissman's lab. Irv is um, an immunologist at Stanford who was intimately involved in the discovery of embryonic stem cells uh, back in the 1980s with mice. And so um, this woman who's in Irv's lab, just as a thought experiment, asked her first year class of medical students to draw a blastocyst. Now these are medical students at Stanford. They know some biology, right? She said, in most cases, they drew something that looked like a tiny fetus. And I'll be getting to the implications of that in just a, in just a moment or two. But these are stem cells. They have the char certain characteristics. Um, above all, self-renewal. And so the blood stem cells, for example, um, are able to produce billions and billions of blood cells. Um, the embryonic stem cell <coughs> is able to produce outside the body in vitro in a Petri dish to produce more stem cells. And it's a kind of factory um, that is able to do this somehow um, without losing its quality of being undifferentiated. When I say undifferentiated, I mean these are the cells that can become any kind of cell. Um, and they're able to reproduce without going down a specific cell line. So they don't become teeth. Um, they don't become eye cells. And they retain that potency to become anything in the body. Those of you who followed the debate, of course, um, about the use of stem cells and especially the der derivation of hum human embryonic stem cells know that there are these two basic types. On the left hand, the human embryonic stem cell, which is pluripotent, meaning it can become any type of cell in the body. It's comparatively easy to grow, fairly easy to culture outside the body. Right now, we don't know to what degree um, if we implant those cells in you or in me, um, we would reject them. Some scientists believe that uh, 
by their very nature, uh, they will not be recognized as foreign by the body. They will not be recognized as not me and create an immune response. But this is far from proven. And in fact, right now, uh, as we speak over the past few months, there's a company uh, in California called Geron, which has gotten approval from the US Food and Drug Administration to do the first human clinical trials uh, of stem cells. And um, you may know this about the FDA, but the FDA, to approve a drug, requires a manufacturer to go through three series of clinical trials. The first is for toxicity, meaning does it poison the person who's getting the drug? The second is for efficacy, and the third is for a combination of efficacy and safety in a larger population. So Geron has crossed over into um, producing stem cells as a drug. I'll talk in a, in a minute or two about um, the specific research program that they have. But one of the large questions that Geron and the FDA and, and science has is will these stem cell treatments trigger an immune response in patients? And if they do, will it be a strong response, a weak response? What's going to happen? And we really don't know the answer to that until the, uh, the first level of the trials are completed. Now, on the other hand, um, after the blastocyst stage, uh, we all have stem cells in our bodies. In fact, we have stem cells throughout our bodies, in our skin, in our bone marrow, and so forth. But these adult stem cells are limited by tissue type, by and large, um, so that they continue to produce cells, for example, in wound healing with your skin, uh, but they're limited in terms of the line of cell that they can produce by the tissue type from whence they, from whence they occur. Uh, so, uh, blood stem cells produce blood cells. Skin stem cells produce um, skin stem cells, or skin cells. Um, <clears throat> they're fairly rare in mature tissue and very hard to find, hard to isolate, and hard to grow. Um, there is evidence that they can be reprogrammed to become other tissue types than the ones from whence they come. But um, this is very early science, and we don't know how difficult this is. But we do know one thing, that they're hard to produce in scale. And that if you wanted to use stem cells as a drug to repair an organ, um, to uh, repair damage in the blood, uh, to uh, uh, repair a damaged spinal cord, that you would need lots of them. So you would need to be able to produce them in quantity. And one of the problems that overhangs this whole science is um, the classic problem of production. How could we make enough even if we knew it worked? Um, this is a large problem in biotechnology, and it's a particular problem in stem cell science. I talked about the reprogrammability and the questions that surround that. Um, again, the science is new. We don't know what it will take. There are some experiments that have shown that, for example, skin, skin uh, uh, stem cells can be reprogrammed, but how uh, variously and, and into what other forms, we're not sure. Um, they do have one clear advantage, which is transplant rejection. So if, for example, I take a skin patch from me and I put it on a wound from you, um, it will wither and die between seven and 10 days uh, because you will create an immune response that rejects that skin graft. Um, if I take my own skin and graft it, say, from my leg to my abdomen, the graft will take, and it will be just like my own skin because I do not provoke that immune response. My body recognizes me as me. Um, and so the potential for taking um, stem cells from your own body, reprogramming them or treating them in some fashion, and using them um, to treat a condition that you have, it's a long way out here, but it may be possible. Um, and there's a lot of scientific literature at very early phases about this right now. <clears throat> so this is a bad illustration that, that uh, I don't think I need to talk about it because I've covered it. Um, but this gives you a simple illustration of what we've just been talking about with respect to the fertilized egg, the, in this case, eight cell embryo as it begins to develop into the blastocyst with a few more cell divisions. This all happening in about five to seven days to that that point where we have those blastocyst stem cells that are in that petri dish. And then the potential for those cells to become 
really anything in the human body. And of course, you'd ask the question, how are they programmed? What are the switches and triggers? What are the genetic triggers that um, channel them in certain directions, which happens very, very quickly. So if we move from the illustration that I have here to another five, six, and seven days, already the cells are differentiating, and they're no longer the pluripotent stem cells that we were talking about that can become anything, that have this extraordinary quality. They're already going down specific channels. So there are a number of scientists um, who uh, have looked at this field who have said that this may be the single most interesting and promising technology, perhaps since our discovery of molecular genetics, perhaps even as important as the discovery of the germ theory of disease by Koch and Pasteur back in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and their excitement uh, revolves around two basic premises. One is this holy grail of cell replacement therapies. So in the cases of many diseases, and particularly genetic diseases, um, <clears throat> the problem is that you have a defective gene that it produces or doesn't produce, for example, an en enzyme that regulates some behavior. There's a disease, for example, called Batten's disease. You know Batten's disease? It's, uh, it's a uh, neurological condition in which there's one gene, which we now know what it is, um, that uh, produces an enzyme that breaks down a certain fluid that develops in the brain. And people who lack that gene overproduce this fluid, and they're okay until about age four or five, but then the fluid starts to build up and to interfere with certain regions of the brain motor coordination and thought and speech, and everyone who has Batten's disease dies. And they all die oh, between age six, seven, no one survives past eight, because the fluid builds up, interferes with brain function, and pretty soon the person can't breathe, and the basic function of life that's regulated by the brain breaks down. The idea, the promise, um, that you could create um, a cell replacement for the um, enzyme that's created and inject that into the brain of a person with Batten's disease and that would home in on, on um, that part of the brain which is continuing to, continuing to produce that in, enzyme is an extraordinary promise and has always been the, um, uh, the dream of people in gene therapy. The more that we know about how genes control diseases, the more we think that it's promising that if we could simply replace that defective gene with one that works properly, then the body would, on its own, self-correct and um, cure the disease. So it's really a magical cure if you think from the, res from the perspective of inserting a gene. As it has turned out, it's been very hard to insert genes, and we've tried lots and lots of different ways. Most of them haven't worked very well. Uh, but among stem cell scientists, the idea that we could use stem cells to, um, in effect, replace faulty genes is highly promising and one of the most important uh, directions in current stem cell research. People who uh, suffer from Parkinson's, for example, um, believe that perhaps before too long, uh, we would be able to insert dopamine-producing brain cells directly into the brain, that they would then produce the dopamine that Parkinson's patients lack, and that those patients could, could uh, return to full functioning. This is the promise, and this is why you see so many um, groups, uh, patient groups who suffer from genetic diseases interested in some stem cell research. Because frankly, the pharmaceutical industry in its current form has not done a good job in many of these areas. We don't have good drugs for Lou Gehrig's disease. We don't have good drugs for Parkinson's. Um, we don't have good drugs for Alzheimer's, on and on. Um, and so the idea that stem cells, by being quite a different approach and a completely different technology, could solve these problems is extremely encouraging to patients and people um, who look within their own families and say, I know this person's going to die or suffer for the rest of her life unless there's a cure, 
And by the way, we don't know any other direction for cures than stem cell science. That's why so much passion has been invested, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Interestingly enough, though, the, the immediate application for, for embryonic stem cell science has been less as a therapy, less as cells that you would put into someone's body to cure a disease, than as a set of research tools. And so the idea that we can grow stem cells, that we can uh, imagine that we can not only grow stem cells, but that we can begin to understand how they are programmed to become certain cell types. This opens up a door, for example, in studying cancers, because you have, um, you could grow um, cancer stem cells. You can uh, develop any cancer tumor type, depending on its genetic profile, and study that in pure form. Uh, and for example, develop small molecules uh, that may block cancer cell reproduction, um, or you, some of you know about angiogenesis, which is the idea of vasculature in cancer tumors. Cancer tumors need blood supply to grow. If you can block the growth of blood supply with an angiogenesis drug, the tumor withers and falls off the, off the tree, so to speak. This is um, an enormously powerful technology, but it's hard to study because people um, who have cancer have complicated genetics. If we could take the cancer out, study it purely on its own, and understand what influences its growth, what inhibits the, the, the growth of tumors, whether solid tumors or not, uh, we would have an enormously powerful research tool. And a lot of the money that has been spent by the National Institutes of Health and by the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine that I'll talk about momentarily have been put in this direction meaning stem cells as research tools. <clears throat> so now we come back to visit a question, and I want to, to open the door to, to a discussion about the morality of this science, um, about the ethical constructs that surround it. Um, one view, um, which you might call the scientific view, um, is that this is a microscopic clump of cells, and that's literally true. Um, you can't draw a dot small enough to uh, represent a blastocyst after four or five cell divisions. So that's what we're talking about, uh, something that's quite tiny that has to be captured by an electron microscope. Literally true, but um, quite quickly we cross over into ideas about humanity and ideas about what constitutes a person um, and ideas about the fetus. This is a cartoon that, that I took from a, a Catholic magazine. It says, if embryonic stem cell research kills me before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Now, this is inaccurate in the sense that um, it, it's inaccurate in two ways. One is this isn't what a blastocyst looks like um, at all. Um, what's drawn here is a proto-person, but there's another uh, attribution, which is the anthropomorphic fallacy, which is to attribute to something that isn't a person the qualities that Shakespeare attributes to a person, to be afraid, to hope, to have friends, everything that we think that makes us people. To attribute these things to something that not only couldn't learn language, but is so far in advance of these other qualities, um, I think misstates the case in an important way. And yet this is an image, as I said before, that many Stanford medical students had when they sat down to draw their little cartoon of a blastocyst. Those of you who've taken uh, human embryology or biology know the Carnegie uh, stages of human development. But I want you to look at that sort of upper left-hand um, column or, or part of the uh, illustration after the zygote uh, at one day. And then as we move into sort of three, four, and five days, this is the stage of life that we're talking about. Again, we're talking about cell divisions until we have a cell mass of 40, 50, 60 cells. Not something that looks like day 23, um, which I had in my cartoon and in my illustration. So the dilemma as it has been posed, um, by the Pope, uh, 
by many right-to-life groups um, in the U.S. and abroad, uh, by President Bush, George W. Bush, in 2001, is the rights of the unborn on the one hand versus the rights of people who are suffering from diseases that stem cells might cure on the other. And so the first thing that I would invite you to question is whether that formulation um, is adequate or um, logical um, or fair. <clears throat> the way that the uh, debate has been framed by the right to life community, by the Catholic Church and others, um, is absolutist in the sense that um, if you walk all the way back to the fertilization of the egg and the zygote, the two, four, six, eight cells, the absolute concession is that that's human life. And at the extreme, that that's human life with an equal claim to rights and protections of civil society that you or I have. Um, now, this is a formulation that's used a lot. It's also one that people are willing to say on the one hand and far less willing to live by um, on the other. One thing I would point out, though, is that the question about what constitutes human life is not a question for biology and not really a question for science. It has much more to do with where you want to draw a line and where you want to assign a label. There isn't, we know exactly what happens uh, biologically from fertilization through death for that matter, which I'll get to in a second. But um, how we describe that, the moral constructs that we overlay on it um, are of course the point and not amenable to a scientific answer. This problem became very, very clear um, during the stem cell debate and decision back in 2001, in, in the summer of 2001, when President Bush, George W. Bush, after uh, what he described as a lot of soul searching and wrenching thought, um, um, imposed a executive order that sharply limited the lines of stem cells that could be used in scientific research supported by the National Institutes of Health. Now, most science in the United States is funded by the NIH. Um, this year, the NIH budgets about $33 billion. And if we go around to labs at UCSB or Cal or Stanford, most of the money that those scientists are using for their projects comes from the NIH. Therefore, NIH policy with respect to stem cell funding or any funding at all is pivotal. It really determines whether that area of science can be pursued uh, by scientists or whether they look and they say, you know, there's really not going to be funding there. It's too risky. I'm going to take my research into a different area. It's important to understand, though, uh, when President Bush made this decision to limit stem cell lines, not to ban it, interestingly enough. Uh, in my view, a ban would have been far more consistent with the principle that he espoused. Uh, but he said, you can use lines, some 60 cell lines that were available up to this date, but you can't make any new ones. Um, so we'll get to what I think is the inconsistency of that in just a second. But where do, these, uh, where do these embryos come from? Where do these blastocysts come from? Well, they come from in vitro fertilization clinics. And as you probably know, there are in vitro fertilization clinics all around the world, and particularly in uh, Western Europe and America. And probably most of you don't know how they work. What they do is they um, harvest eggs from um, a woman. Uh, they fertilize those eggs um, in vitro outside the body. Um, and they make a bunch of these. They don't just do one. Uh, they do eight or 10 or 12 or 15. And then they look at them to see which ones um, by, based on their experience, seem to have the best likelihood of success when they're implanted in the woman's uterus. <clears throat> the rest are destroyed or frozen um, to be destroyed later. So there is a mass production of blastocyst industry 
in the United States and Western Europe, which is called the in vitro fertilization industry. Um, and its byproduct are blastocysts, and they're sitting in freezers all over the place. Um, I was not, until more recently, uh, aware of the process of, of strict selection, uh, but uh, I was shown at Stanford uh, what in vitro fertilization physicians who are looking to implant uh, one of these uh, blastocysts uh, in, in a woman are looking at, and there are large differences in quality. And I guess through experience, uh, they can uh, greatly increase the odds that when this embryo is implanted, it will come to term and yield a healthy child. Uh, but even so, the best people in the world at this only get success rates of around 40%. So um, about two-thirds of them don't work, and depending on where you go, it can be far worse than that. Um, with respect, remember me talking uh, just a, a few minutes ago about research tools. Um, while this is a big source of blastocyst for science and a very robust source, um, it only represents a small part of the population. Uh, most people who are clients of in vitro fertilization clinics are richer and wider um, than the population in general. And so, if you were depending entirely on this population and you wanted to uh, study something like sickle cell disease, which is uh, highly concentrated in the African American population, uh, you would not have very many options. Um, one of the critiques of using um, the in vitro fertilization clinic as the main source for blastocysts and for stem cell research has been that it doesn't really represent American society. And that what we want to do is have studies that are about all of us, not just a tiny subsegment. <clears throat> Some of you probably know that Robert Evans, who pioneered um, in vitro fertilization in England, uh, won the Nobel Prize this past year. Um, Anyone want to guess how many IVF babies have been born since the, since the pioneering of the technique? Wild guess, anybody? Four million. So I have to tell you that IVF was very controversial when it was new for exactly the same reasons um, that I'm describing with respect. When does life begin? What is the inherent nature of this um, blastocyst? Uh, aren't we producing lots of, of lives that are going to be wasted? Isn't this a careless interference with God's plan for reproduction in human life? Um, all of these arguments were made against in vitro fertilization. And why did they fail? Why did they basically drop into um, a, complete, uh, <coughs> a complete void? Well, this is the reason. Four million babies, most of them healthy, most of them born to infertile couples who couldn't have had a baby any other way. Um, and so when you have someone standing up and saying, you know, I was born via this technology, it becomes very hard in a congressional hearing for someone across the table to say, well, that was terrible technology. Uh, it, defeats the, it defeats the argument. So we come back around uh, to revisiting the argument in 1981. There were some cynics who said that one of the main reasons that the president, who was not known for his intellectual curiosity with respect to science, uh, became so interested in this particular issue, um, and some thought that it might have had to do with uh, the Catholic vote in the United States. Um, uh, none of us really knows. but. Uh, after they met, uh, the, the president, uh, even though a Protestant, felt he had found a soulmate with respect to this issue. On the other side, if you will, of this public debate, um, more than any place else, this roiled in California. Um, and the reason why is because, in the first instance, California has the greatest collection of basic research institutes in the world. University of California, Stanford, Caltech, and all those private institutes like Salk, Sanford Burnham, Scripps, uh, there's a very long list. And many of these institutes were involved um, in the early stages of stem cell research when the president in August of 2001 
uh, basically drew the curtain on NIH and said, NIH is not going to be funding this research. Um, and two groups of people were particularly offended. Now, California, you know, is a blue state with a, a democratic registration plurality of about 12% during that time, um, went strongly um, uh, for uh, Al Gore in the 2000 election. And uh, Bush was less popular here than, than uh, perhaps in any other state. Uh, but California ha also had more at stake. And there was an interesting chemistry that happened in what I would view as the Hollywood culture. On the one hand, a number of people, particularly uh, people in Hollywood, who had uh, children who had type 1 diabetes. And uh, in my experience, these parents are some of the most passionate patient advocates in the world. They live with the daily experience of a child with a really serious disease, a disease that hasn't had much good science uh, devoted to it over the past several years, um, and for which there are not very many good technologies, good drugs uh, for their kids. And so for them to look at stem cell science and to have scientists say, you know, one of the early targets for stem cell science will be type 1 diabetes really catalyzed them and got a lot of them um, to become uh, active. At the same, same time, people like uh, Michael J. Fox, whom you know, and uh, Christopher Reeve, um, who had a spinal cord injury from a, from a horse accident and uh, severed his spinal cord, um, were looking at the potential for stem cell science for their own conditions and standing up and saying, you know, we really need to do this. This is something that, that California needs to lead in, even if uh, the federal government um, has, it refuses to go there. And so that was the genesis in 2004 of Proposition 71. It was a California ballot initiative put before the voters. And its uh, substance was that uh, there would be a $3 billion general obligation bond um, whose proceeds would go to fund stem cell science to the tune of about $300 million a year. Um, so California would, if this passed, become the world center for stem cell science with much more funding flowing into our labs than anywhere else in the world. Um, some of you may remember the campaign, and the campaign was dominated uh, really by people like Christopher Reeve standing there saying this is the only hope. Um, it passed by 59%, uh, almost 60% of the voters. And in my view, it's uh, quite extraordinary. In, the sense, in this sense, that if you think of democracy, public policy, direct expression of people, and you think of science, there is almost never a case in which people vote directly on science policy. It just doesn't happen. This is, without any question, the greatest expression of direct democracy with respect to science direction in the history of the world. Nothing close. Now, These were the kinds of images that people saw during the campaign. Patients talking about their own hope, hopes for their family. And at the end, it passed, as I mentioned. Um, the governor, uh, who was on the, the, the governor, of course, was a Republican. And Republicans tended to oppose uh, stem cell research. They tended to back the president. Um, but uh, the, a man who was chairman of my board at the time, uh, who's a scientist himself, uh, and a molecular biologist, went to see the governor. And uh, he sat down across from him. And he said, explain to me what the science is and whether this is hyper hope. And so the man's name is Ed Penhote. And he explained the science to the governor. And he said, I'm going to support this. And Ed remained silent, but he was quite surprised. And then the governor looked up and he said, you know, um, my great hero growing up was President Kennedy. And President Kennedy said, we're going to go to the moon. And he didn't live to see it, but the Apollo project, what we accomplished in going to the moon, spun off so many fabulous inventions. I mean, basically from the internet to new materials to uh, rafts of new information technologies. And he said, that's, that's the kind of dream that I think stem cell science represents. So the governor, just before the election, uh, threw his weight behind it. It probably didn't matter very much, but symbolically it was important. 
And so California created, in effect, a kind of mini National Institutes of Health called the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. That's what CRM stands for. And uh, it put together a board to figure out how to distribute the money. It was held up for four or five years by lawsuits, uh, mainly from right to life groups who said it was unconstitutional and sought to block it on technical grounds. At the end of the day, those lawsuits were uh, um, overturned um, in court. And uh, today, the uh, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine is distributing close to $300 million a year. And yet, um, there's, there's an important critical factor we have to keep bringing back into this science. This is a Korean postage stamp from the year 2005. And it's about stem cell science. And you see the person on the right hand, red part, in a wheelchair, and it's sort of moving through stages and then leaping out of the wheelchair and, and embracing, uh, the couple embracing a uh, symbol of health. Um, Unfortunately, the Korean stem cell program turned uh, out to be a fraud, you know, a massive case of scientific fraud. Um, but I think that, that uh, while we certainly haven't seen fraud in California, we have seen a kind of disconnect uh, between the promise of stem cell science, the idea of Christopher Reeve somehow being able to get out of that chair, or Michael J. Fox, uh, able in his own lifetime to receive a treatment that would cure his Parkinson's disease. We have that promise here on the one hand, which was used quite adroitly by the champions of Prop 71 to garner public support for their ballot initiative. The truth is that the lag between the basic science that we've been talking about and what it will mean for patients with respect to real drugs that you could get or you could get for your child is probably a very long way off. Um, and that there's a tendency, certainly for the scientists who benefit from this and our evangelists and believers in it, perhaps to overstate the case. And in my view, that produces some damage, uh, a damage of credibility, um, a sense that where are the cures that we've been promised? And uh, one of the things that's going to happen over the next, let's see, 2004, 2014, so 13, over the next two years, um, Californians will have to decide whether to renew the funding for the Stem Cell Institute at the same level or less. And in a time of fiscal crisis, you all know what's happening to the state budget, uh, people may ask very hard questions about whether the promises that were made uh, have been lived up to uh, by this extraordinary effort. <clears throat> so, so I want to introduce something just, just for a second for you to ponder. And it goes like this. Um, the relationship between our concepts of life and death, between what we think is moral or immoral, how we imagine the human body and all of our human processes don't exist in a vacuum. They exist in a kind of dialogue with science. Um, and when science changes and medicine changes, it forces us to rethink what we think we know about life and death. Um, historically, death has seemed fairly clear to people. The cessation, the cessation of bodily function um, in classic rabbinic literature, the, the failure of the heartbeat. Um, and yet, in the 1960s, beginning in the 1960s, we in America and then Western Europe and most of the world changed its definition of death. Anybody know why? Any idea? Organ transplantation, starting with kidneys. In the 1960s, um, technology was developed um, in Seattle to enable uh, the transplantation of kidneys to people whose kidneys were failing. These people would die without a transplant. Um, and two things happened. One was um, a shunt was developed that enabled the technology to work. And the other was the uh, development of immunosuppressive drugs that uh, uh, prevented um, a person who got a, a kidney from a donor from rejecting that kidney. Well, how do you get a kidney? 
You can get one from someone who's live. You can live with one kidney. Uh, but most kidneys didn't come from living people. They came from people who had been killed in motorcycle accidents or people who were brain dead. And so the question became, we have people here dying without a kidney. We have kidneys, but the people in whom they are, are they dead or alive? What do we do? Uh, a very profound question. Um, and not without enormous Sturm und Drang did medicine deal with this. The focal point of it really in the late 1960s was at Harvard and what was called colloquial at the time, the Harvard Brain Death Committee. Uh, kind of a poor name. But uh, it, in, it included ethicists from the Divinity School, um, uh, people from different branches of medicine and so forth. And it was the sort of ground zero for redefining death as a flat EEG or cessation of brain function. But it was a very um, practical uh, utilitarian move, if you think about it, because what it enabled was heart transplantation, liver transplantation, kidney transplantation. So when those things became possible, we really moved the paradigm for what constituted death. It seems to me that in a not completely dissimilar way, um, as stem cell science moves forward, and the first time we see, perhaps in the Geron trial, an effective therapy that's made from embryonic stem cells, I would expect the needle with respect to, to move as well in terms of how we think of early stage cellular growth compared to fully developed human life. So I'm going to end uh, just by making an observation that doesn't have anything or very much to do with what I've said before. Um, there are times in history um, when the political culture of a region, a country, and so forth determines the future of its science perhaps for a generation or even more. I think we've been through a time like that in California with respect to stem cell science. Uh, we've kind of gone our own way and have a funding base uh, that has enabled the most promising stem cell science to, to be happening here. In Europe, back in the middle 1970s, <clears throat> when uh, biotechnology was new, biotechnology just means genetic engineering. It means cloning a gene and producing a human protein. Or, in the case of uh, genetically modified organisms, a plant protein. Um, it was developed in California uh, by uh, Herb Boyer and Stanley Cohen at the University of California at San, San Francisco. Um, and it was available in Europe and it was available here. But in Europe, the green parties um, were so resistant to the very concept of biotech, thinking that it would create monsters, uh, that it would ruin the environment, that it would produce a human future that, that no one wanted to live in, that they completely shut down the science. And almost all biotechnology from Europe, from the large drug companies in Europe, um, like uh, Sando and, um, and Merck SGA, moved to the US. And, and so it would have been strange in 1985 oh, say 1985, for someone from Europe to walk through Berkeley, California, and see the Bayer Pharmaceutical, big German company, that their major biotech research R&D facility was in Berkeley, California. And the reason why was partly what California had built in terms of research enterprise, but partly what Europe had excluded through their policy. And it's really only today, in the past few years, that uh, the EU now is making a concerted effort to redevelop uh, the European biotech industry. The sense that they had lost out on one of the most important developments in the history of medicine, and not incidentally an important driver of their economy, is something that the, the new European politicians take quite seriously. Um, so, in a sense, you should be proud to be at the University of California. You should be proud to be in California, because I think that uh, what we're doing is not only quite extraordinary, but somewhat unprecedented in, in the history of the world.
curing Parkinson's and, and ALS and the things you talked about are obviously these big holy grail goals. Are there right. any um, intermediary things that are, that are maybe more on the near horizon? It's a good question. Um, the, the, the closest we are to having a stem cell therapy for an important condition is in um, repairing damage to the spinal cord. That's what the Geron trials are about at the FDA. Um, so what we've seen is that there are a number of experiments. The best, ones, best known ones are by Hans Kirsted at the University of California at Irvine, who has clearly demonstrated that um, you can uh, damage the spinal cord in rats. Um, so what happens, the spinal cord is damaged and the neurons, the nerve cells um, in that region don't grow back in the electrical impulses that um, the brain sends to different regions of the body don't get there, they're interrupted. Um, and that's a dead zone. What, what, what Kirsten has shown is that you can inject embryonic stem cells into the spinal, spinal cords of mice and they regenerate and grow back function and the impulses are communicated, and they can get very close to normal function. Works in mice. We don't know whether it will work in people. Um, there's a lot of hope around this, and that's what, why the FDA approved this clinical trial, because for these people, like Christopher Reeve, there is no other possible therapy. This is it. If it works, um, it may, may be a little bit like the uh, IVF example. If you have people who were paralyzed in car accidents, bound in wheelchairs and whatnot, stand up and walk, that's the dream. And it will certainly provide some additional impetus for stem cell science. What can America do to make certain that this flight of a brain trust over to China, which is subsidizing our scientists to leave and go over there, uh, what, what specific technologies would enable us to compete with this? Because right now, it seems to be a data mining race where these gene chips or whatever it is are generating so much that it's a bioinformatics and computing problem, less an innovation issue. It seems as though with enough bodies and enough supercomputers, they can get ahead of us pretty quickly. Well, that's, a, that, that's a good question. I don't know whether I share that bias exactly because there's so much more involved in sequencing genes. Um, the, uh, and you can see how hard it is if you sort of helicopter up to 50,000 feet and look at the um, successful firms in my industry, for example, um, and what it's taken for them to get there. Well, it's, it's in general taken many, many years, 12, 15, 20 years, um, and many billions of dollars. Um, and within the context of, of a medical research culture that we have here. I don't think that's something you can do quickly elsewhere. Um, nonetheless, um, I was talking to somebody um, uh, before the meeting started about some papers that came out in science a week or two ago, and it has to do with the total amount of information in the world. There's a lot. Um, but the compounding of information because of our iPads and our Androids, our smart devices and whatnot, creates a kind of, of uh, geometric accelerator to information as it's reanalyzed, shared, and in the sharing, subject to different analysis, and then uh, becomes second and third order information. Um, this is a new phenomenon in the history of the world, and it's happening very quickly, as you all know, as you go to your own smartphones or get the next generation iPad as it comes out and so forth. We don't know um, at all what kinds of business structures, social structures and so forth this will drive, but we know that it will create change. What is the position on the use of um, public money to create inventions which are then um, patented and presumably commercialized. That's a, so that's a good question. The question is, so here's public money going into an institute. Um, it funds inventions. People patent those inventions and uh, in some cases, if they're successful, make commercial products and maybe make millions or billions of dollars, right? This is the model for, for example, the American drug industry. And until uh, 25 years ago, um, 
America was spending, at that time, billions of dollars at the NIH and not getting very many drugs out here. And Congress looked at, uh, and I'm answering your, I will answer your question, Congress looked at why are we getting so few drugs and spending so much money in basic research, and they identified the patent system as the problem. And there was a great um, debate in the halls of Congress, uh, and it was led by Senator Hatch and uh, Representative Henry Waxman, and it ended up producing a law called Hatch-Waxman that did a couple of things. For one thing, it created the generic drug industry, and today about 75% of all prescriptions in the U.S. are for generic drugs. It enabled the FDA to uh, prove generic drugs that are follow-ons or knockoffs of the original invention. But it also did something else, which it allowed universities and academic institutions who uh, were funded by the National Institutes of Health to patent their inventions and then license those patents or assign those patents to private companies including ones that, for example, were created by professors and venture capitalists. This had an enormously accelerating effect on the, uh, uh, on the path to market for inventions that otherwise no one would have made the investment in. The key, the key to what we're talking about here is private investment. Um, it's very possible, as has happened in the past two generations in Europe, to have a lot of great science that sits in universities because no one is going to put up a billion dollars to take it through the FDA and commercialize it. In order to attract private investment, you, me, any of us to write checks to invest in a company, you need to have some sense that um, the potential reward um, is commensurate with the risk of your investment. And in the case of uh, biotech, these are extremely risky investments. Um, in, in the world of pharma, only about one in seven drugs even makes it into phase three clinical trials. So most drugs fail. Um, with respect to CIRM, um, I think that uh, on the one hand, the state, and particularly the state legislature, has said if we, if we fund inventions, somehow the taxpayers and Californians should <coughs> share in that financial success. And you have people on the investment side over here saying, you know what, uh, look at the NIH example, and unless the conditions are right, people are going to invest in Google or Facebook, and they're not gonna put money into uh, life sciences. And that's where we find ourselves. <laughs>